I can't tell you how many times I've had a knock at my door. I've come out, come out the front door, and there's someone there. Hey, let me. Can I tell you about Jesus? And um, and I said, you can. I said, but let me tell you, I'm Jewish. Again, I, I haven't told them that I'm a Jewish believer. Yeah, yeah. I, I now I do it as a as a challenge to see what what will happen. Yeah. I have never had a person finish the conversation. As the the moment I've said I'm Jewish, they say, "Oh, that's nice," and they they turn and they walk away. Wow. Well, hello everybody. Welcome to the Gateway Center for Israel. I am very excited about our conversation today because we have with us Ari Waldman, a Messianic rabbi from Baruch Hashem in Dallas. Uh, Gateway and Baruch Hashem have been in relationship for how long now? I mean, since the beginning of Gateway, <laughs> beginning and yeah, and, and before that, I mean, yeah. uh, and it has been an incredible relationship that I've got to to witness firsthand the past year and a half. Um, and I'm just excited to talk with you. So thank you for being here. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm excited. Thanks for having me. I think our conversation, what what I want uh, you to help us and help our listeners um, is answer some questions that I think Christians. Uh, and Jewish people might be asking, but maybe have no place to ask that question, or maybe are embarrassed or nervous to ask the question. You know, when you, as uh, as Andy Dwyer says in Parks and Rec, he says, I don't know what the other 98% of the 2% milk is, and I'm afraid to ask at this point. So it's like, sometimes we get so far into something, we're like, I can't ask that now. Like, we've gone too far. I can't ask someone's name 45 minutes into a conversation. Oh, yeah. So... I want to maybe backtrack a little, little bit and just talk about some foundational things. So you are a Messianic rabbi, but you're a Messianic Jew. Um, what does that mean, that you're a Messianic Jew? So very simply, I mean, the, in the boil it all down is yeah. I'm a Jewish person who believes that Yeshua also known as Jesus, mm -hmm. is the Messiah, the promised Messiah of Israel, yeah. who has come. And will come again. Yeah. So that's the simply, I'm a, I'm a Jewish person who believes that Jesus is the Messiah. Yeah, that's great. Some people have made comments on our YouTube channel and have confusion. So then are you, are you a Christian? Wouldn't you be a Christian then if you believe in Jesus? That's a, a good question. <laughs> and it's a complicated question. Yeah. Um, I don't utilize the term Christian yeah. with regards to myself. Um, now, if it helps someone understand what I believe, I might, I might. Yeah. But um, there's there's a pretty volatile uh, history between Judaism and Christianity, between Jewish people and Christians. Yeah. Um, really, it's not quite two thousand years old, but it's yeah. certainly close to it. Yeah. So I don't lead with. I'm a Christian. Yeah. Uh, I struggle. I struggle with, am I? Yeah. I, I think, I think in the broadest definition of the term, I am. Yeah. I, I, I'm okay with that. We almost have to define what Christian is. Yeah. That's, that's a good, that's a good point. Because cr Christian to most people unknowingly means Gentile. Yes, that's true. And you know, actually I, I grew up here in Texas. Um, you can go out and go to, Target and just be like, are you Christian? Or or yeah. I say Target, go to Walmart in some <laughs> yeah. small town. Are you a yeah. Christian? Oh yeah, I'm a for Christian. sure at Walmart. At Walmart, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. I grew up in Texas. Yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, and, and the reality is, it's not actually the strict definition of what a Christian is. Yeah, it generally, it yeah. doesn't have to be. You grew up in Texas. You grew yeah. up anywhere. <laughs> yeah, but it's it uh, the by the strictest definition, a Christian is someone who believes that Jesus is the Messiah. Yeah. And follows his direct his directives, his directions, his yeah the way the way he taught us to live yeah, and and the Jewish community would see anyone who believes in Jesus as a Christian totally, but their sticking point would be so then if a Jewish person believes in Jesus, they're no longer Jewish. Yep, that's uh, that's the common thought. And why would they believe that? Uh, because, because Jewish people have been taught for now hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of years that yeah. 
there's Jews and there's Christians and the two shall never meet. Yeah. And actually Christians have been taught that too. I, yeah. I would say it's probably one of the few things that Judaism and Christianity agree on is yeah. that you can't be Jewish and believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Yeah. And um, it, it's interesting because in in relation to Israel or immigrating to Israel or even in relation to can I still be Jewish? Yeah. There, you can be Jewish and be Buddhist. Yeah. They even have names for them. They're called Boojews. <laughs> Uh, you it's can be name. you can be a, <laughs> you can be an atheist and be Jewish, yeah. Which is actually, to me, uh, it's against the like very basic tenet of Judaism. Yeah, like the Judaism is a relationship between the Creator and us. Yeah, and, and to not believe that there's a Creator actually kind of separates you from that. And again, yeah. the rest of the Jewish world accepts, yeah, Buddhist Jewish people. Uh, Hindu Jewish people, yeah. atheist Jewish people. Again, there's a, in the broad sense, they're accepted, but when you get into the religious sense, there's yeah. a whole vast yeah. variety of. Yeah, there's, it's like the is, denominations of Judaism might totally. say different things, the same with same Right, you get into Orthodox or Reform or Conservative. Yeah. And, they're going to have different levels of acceptance or. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I completely agree with you. You know, I think um, it's crazy that we even have these conversations and we have to have these conversations and bring clarity to, yes, a Jewish person can believe in a Jewish Messiah who was told by the angel Gabriel that he was going to be the savior of Israel. And he himself said that I come for the lost sheep of Israel. And Mm -hmm. so it's, I mean, it's like, of course, a Jewish person can believe in Jesus, but we have now about I would say 18, 1900 years of replacement theology where we pick up at the Old Test, we pick up the New Testament, we pick up with Jesus saving the world, and we kind of separated him from Israel. Um, so something that I've just noticed, and I want to ask if, if you feel this and if your congregation, other Messianic Jewish people in your relationship feel this, it feels like the Messianic uh, Jewish community is almost rejected by both. Oh yeah, because you're 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 not Christian enough to stay Jewish and be at the church. There's no place for for you to maintain your Jewish heritage and your your Jewish identity in most churches. So you're not Christian enough to come to the church, but then you're not Jewish enough to to come to the synagogue because you believe in Jesus and therefore you're too Christian and not Jewish enough to be in the synagogue. Is that rejection something that's felt? Oh yeah. <clears throat> I grew up so maybe I maybe I'll give a little bit of of my own story yeah. and my family story. My father, my father's Jewish and my mom's not. And um my father came to faith in Jesus as the Messiah. Um nearly 50 years ago. And it it's interesting through through a number of circumstances yeah um which i i i'll leave him to tell his own story but through yeah. a num- number of circumstances he um he began to investigate jesus he was trying to prove jesus wrong and yeah and finished the book and closed closed his book and and said okay you know jesus is a cool guy um I, you know i like him he was into the healing arts and all these different things but yeah. he wasn't the messiah and um, at that point, um, in in Judaism, there's what is known as a bat kol, which is a, a voice from heaven. So, like when when uh, in Luke, I think it's in Luke three, when Jesus goes down to the Jordan and he gets baptized, he gets immersed yeah. into the water, and John is there, and and it, Yeshua comes out, and it says that there's a voice from heaven that says, "This is my son." So that's a it's a common. It's a common thing in Judaism to yeah. have a bot coal. I shouldn't say common. It, it's a common common knowledge that it exists. Yeah. Rare, and, but it exists. Yeah, yeah. And so my dad closed his book and said, you know what? Jesus is a cool guy, but probably not the Messiah. Yeah. And at that moment, um, it was kind of like time froze, and he had this bot coal experience, and, and the voice from heaven said, Marty, it's time for you to come home to the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Mm. And he knew at that moment that that was through Jesus. It, it wasn't, he didn't come out and say, oh, I know Jesus is the Messiah. I know, yeah. 
Jesus is all he all he knew was Jesus was for real. Yeah. And um, so anyways, he and my mom moved down here to Texas and uh, eventually, probably eight, eight or nine years later, started yeah. a Messianic congregation. And I was born into that. And the reason they started Messianic congregation is because my dad felt felt this rejection from the the Christian world, but also a rejection from the Jewish world. Yeah, um, his parents were Holocaust survivors, and and um, yeah, one was an atheist and one was was religious, but they neither one of them were happy about his decision. That, that's the nicest way I can put it. Yeah, and um, when he would go to churches. They would say, oh, you're Jewish. Well, you don't need that anymore because you're a Christian now. Yeah. And actually, in some cases, now this is some extreme cases, and, and I don't know that I can say I've heard it existing recently, but it's not, not too distant past. But um, some cases they would be like, well, if you're really Christian, like here's a ham sandwich, like yeah. prove it. And um, like to which is to me, nowhere in the Bible does it ever say if if you're a Christian, then yeah. you got to eat a ham sandwich. Yeah, which um, for people listening, you, they're they're saying break coke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Eat, eat a pig, you know, because yeah. it doesn't matter anymore. Yeah, and it's uh, saying you're no longer Jewish. Yeah, it's really a, it's a it's actually when you get into the historical evidence, what it is historically is it was proof that you were rejecting Judaism or your Jewish heritage. And renouncing it, it was utilized that way in the Spanish Inquisition, yeah, in the Crusades, and in throughout, yeah, other times of persecution, yeah. And um, so, my dad wanted a place. He wanted a, a a place where his children. This is part of part of the vision of the congregation, which I actually I I now lead. His vision for the congregation was number one to have a place where Jewish people um, could believe that Yeshua was the Messiah and continue to practice as Jews. Yeah. Um, he also wanted a place where Christians could come and learn about the Jewish roots of their faith. Yeah. And he wanted a place where his where <clears throat> where his children, where you could raise your own family. Yeah. In in this idea in that your family were both Jews, but but um if I can like we continue to be Jewish people, but we just believe that the Messiah has come. So the only yeah. really difference, uh, well, uh, other people might disagree with me. Yeah. So, but um, Jewish people, especially religious Jewish people, yeah, they all believe in the Messiah. Yeah. The exception for us is we believe the Messiah already has come. Yeah. And that he'll come again. Yeah. And so. Um, and that his name is Yeshua. Yeah. And so, I mean, I've had conversations with religious Jewish people, and they say, you know what? If if when the Messiah comes, it's Yeshua, that's okay. Yeah. And, like, we we can get on board with that. Yeah. The problem is, 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 is there's also a recognition that he has already come, and, yeah. and, and, and what do we do with that kind of intermediate space? Yeah. Um, so, anyways, we the, the congregation was kind of, for the purpose really in my dad's mind of yeah. me and my my siblings yeah. being able to grow up with this identity of being Jewish people yeah but also knowing that Yeshua was the Messiah and that we could live life like that yeah and so I've I've carried it on the same way in my and with with the hope that my children can grow up in that same and that they're comfortable with yeah. both yeah we talk a lot about at the Center for Israel the distinction of Jew and Gentile, and how it's a God-given distinction that remains. And, you know, I just talked about with Nick in our interview, uh, you know, people will say, well, Galatians 3, there's no longer Jew or Gentile. We joked about this before sure. we hit record. It's like, we, we want these scriptures to have dot, dot, dots, and we don't want to know what the dot, dot, dot is. There's no longer Jew, Jew and Gentile, dot, dot, dot. We don't want to read, dot, dot, dot also says, and there's no longer male or female. Right. Another distinction that continues and coming into a new covenant doesn't change that distinction. You know, I, I use the example of when a husband and wife get married, scripture says they become one flesh, one flesh of male and female. Mm -hmm. But now there's a new unity there. And Jew and Gentile come into a new covenant that Jesus came to bring. 
and they become one new man, Scripture says, of Jew and Gentile. Sure. They're still Jew and Gentile, but there's a new unity that wasn't there before. And we struggle to understand this. It's almost easier if it's just black and white. Well, you're you're either Jewish or you're a Christian. But it's like, are we reading the same Bible? Yeah, so it's interesting. Um, If you want easy... I would not recommend being in relationship with our God. <laughs> yeah. Um, because being in relationship is just that. It's it's yeah. a difficult and messy thing. Yeah. For those of us who are married, it's yeah. it's, it's not it's not cakewalks every day. You understand why Paul says hey, it's maybe it's better not to be married. <laughs> yeah, totally. You can be more productive when you <laughs> yeah, when, when you don't have another person that you have to be held accountable to. Yeah. Um but when you when but when you have the two of you together, then yeah. it, it pr- produces a different type of of outcome. Yeah. Um, so you know, single people, by all means, like you can you can push, you can make decisions at your own clip, which is yeah. usually quick. Yeah. But it's every time somebody comes and asks me a question, hey, can you do this? I'm like, let me go talk, talk to, my to my wife. wife. <laughs> yeah. Which it, I mean, again, it delays the process, yeah. but in the end, it makes a better decision. Yeah. At least in my in my. Yeah circumstances yeah totally so let's talk about a a messianic synagogue so you talked about how it was a place for uh your children and you know kind of just jewish children to have this belief in yeshua messiah but also maintain their jewish identity what does jewish identity look like uh after putting faith in jesus because it's clearly not the you know sit in the pew with a ham sandwich and devoid of all Jewish culture and all Jewish identity. What it, is there a change though? Is that different? Is that every Jewish person's on a journey if they give their life to Jesus? It's it looks different. What is what are the kind of staples of? Yeah, being you know, that's, Jewish. That's a a simple and complicated question. <laughs> like most um, in the in yeah the, the Jewish I, world, I would say I I mean and just in, like let me start with my own family. Yeah, in my own family, uh, we have Shabbat dinners on Friday night. Yeah, um, my kids ask me questions. Uh, you know, we'll sit around, and, and often now, it, oftentimes we'll we'll have my parents over and my wife's mom over. And we'll sit around and and I encourage the children to ask questions. Mm-hmm. And you ask questions about tradition. You can ask questions about the Bible. You can ask questions about, hey, grandma and grandpa, you know, when you were 10 years old, like, what did you dress up as for Purim? Yeah. Like, like you know, ask whatever question you want because yeah. um, I think for my children, it's hard to, and, and it was the same for me, mm-hmm. it's hard to, see my grandparents as 10 year olds. Like it's like, it's almost a near impossibility. Mm. And so like, I think we can learn a lot from the experience from our parents. So anyways, yeah. with my children, like, this is it like it Shabbat dinner is a time to, yeah to have these questions and have these discussions. And, yeah. and, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we're pretty basic right now. I have a three year old and it's really hard to keep his, um, his attention. <laughs> yeah, totally. So like we keep our, our 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 the liturgical aspect, the observance aspect pretty yeah. pretty small at this moment. Yeah. Um, but we grow it like what we did two years ago was very different even than what we do now. Yeah. And um just because he's now beginning to grow up into it and yeah and understand and, and that sort of thing. And so in our family uh, I mean, we celebrate all the feasts and festivals that are listed off in Leviticus 23. Yeah. Um, we do, like right now, we're in the middle of Hanukkah. Mm-hmm. So my kids are, you know, figuring out what eight days of presence looks like. Yeah. Uh, which actually in my family, I was inspired by by um, my sister. And with her kids, they, they decided one night of Hanukkah, instead of receiving presents, you go give to a charity. And mm. so we let our children, you know, we choose a charity. Everybody's got to agree on it. Yeah. And, but we let them choose it and it's cool. And we'll donate to a charity and we'll go serve somewhere else. And yeah, and we'll do, uh, actually this year, my wife for, Han- I'm, I'm getting too much into Hanukkah. <laughs> Anyways, it's because what is what we're in, but we do yeah. Hanukkah. We do Purim. We do, you do the feast. We do the feast and festivals. We do Shabbat. Yeah. So we, we don't eat pork. We don't eat shrimp. Yeah. Um, 
So at so, least not intentionally. Yeah, yeah. Nowadays you gotta you gotta ask the waiter. Yeah, everything. it's it's problem when you go somewhere and you're like, I don't even know what that is. I can't. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. So there. So it's uh, you know the in the broadest sense of the word, it's obeying Torah. Yeah. Um. And as you kind of get more, you know, zoomed in, there's different aspects. Yeah, you can get into some nuances where. Yeah. And this this happens in every religious setting, but yeah. I might say something that somebody disagrees with, and I might disagree yeah. with you. It's I, I'm I'm okay with healthy disagreement; it doesn't bother me. Yeah, but the the issue at the kind of start of uh, the, you, uh, the I'll say Baruch Hashem and other Messianic synagogues is there wasn't a place for that at the church. Yeah, that's true. My dad my dad was not comfortable. Yeah. And um, I, I totally back then. I totally see it still to this day. Like I was I had a conversation with a messianic Jewish girl who um used to be at Gateway and she's a dear friend of ours. And at Gateway, you know, Gateway's a little bit different than sure. most churches. You know, we have a Shabbat service and you know, we have many Jewish members at our church, but when she moved into a different uh different state, different church, she was like, I don't know if there's a place for me here. I don't know if I feel welcomed here. I don't know if I, I might feel welcome, but I don't know if my Jewishness is welcomed here. Um, and so I think it's something that people, Jewish people often struggle with and mm-hmm. are, are, are many times put into a place where you have to choose. Are you going to choose to- Christianity? You're going to choose Orthodox, Orthodox or you know, mainstream to- Judaism? Totally. It's really funny. I had a conversation, I don't know, 15 years ago uh, with another Messianic Jewish person. And, and we were talking about, um, I was recently out of college and she said, well, you know, where you were, did you go to synagogue or did you go to Messianic congregation? I said, there was no Messianic congregation. She says, well, did you go to church or did you go to synagogue? And, uh, I mean, maybe this is a bad thing to say on a video, but, um, <laughs> I, honestly, when I was in college, I didn't really do a whole lot. Yeah. Religiously. Yeah. But, um, I, for a little bit, I went to a church. I, I was never comfortable in a church or at least in the churches where I, where I was. Yeah. And I went to synagogue for a little bit. There actually was, I was in a small town, which I was very surprised that there was a synagogue. Yeah. And so I would go to the synagogue for Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah. Yeah. And, you know, maybe another time or two. But yeah. in, in reality, in the school semester, I would go for probably three Saturdays a year. Yeah. Which, okay, maybe is on par for some Jewish people, but it was not, yeah. not normal for me. Yeah. And um, so I was talking to her, to my friend, and I said, well, where would you go? And and, and, they, and this person responded, well, you know, I, I went to church and I said, I just was never, never comfortable in a church. Yeah. And, um, and they said, well, but you believe in Jesus. And I said, yeah, I said, I'm not saying I, I, I don't. Yeah. I'm just telling you, it was just, it was not the, what was comfortable for me. Yeah. And uh, ironically, this person is now living in Israel and, and married and has kids. And well, so, um, yeah. So will you will you talk about I think there's there's a stark difference between what happens at a weekend service at a church, what happens on a Saturday night in a synagogue. Um where does a messianic synagogue fall into that? So can you explain like I think we all know what a what a church service would be. You know, you sure. can come in, you have worship and you have uh a message and then maybe a response time. Sure. And then maybe mingling yeah, Sunday so let school. me uh, let me uh, I'll say this: Messianic synagogues are, as far as I, the ones I've been to are all different. Okay, like very different. So maybe just speaking to um, what so I'll, I'll talk to ours. I will yeah. say some some Messianic synagogues meet on Friday nights. Mm-hmm. Some meet on Saturday morning, and then yeah. there I do know of at least a couple that meet on Saturday afternoons or evenings. Okay, um, I would say probably the majority. It's Friday meet night. on on Saturday mornings. Actually. Saturday morning, oh, okay. And um, I don't know if that's because of the influence of the church services being yeah. on a Sunday. But oh, these are messianic synagogues. Yeah, these are okay, messianic synagogues. But typical um, synagogue. Typical synagogues will either meet Friday night or Saturday, Saturday morning. morning. Okay. Um, uh, there's probably some there's some Saturday evenings also. Yeah, yeah. Um, but really, you're it's all centered around. Um, it's in Leviticus 23 where it says Shabbat is a day for the Lord. It's a holy day. Mm -hmm. And, um, it says that you'll have a holy convocation, which we translate that to be, we're going to have a service. Yeah. Um, so in the, in the, 
in the in the Jewish world in, in in Judaism, there are three different prayer services: one in the morning, one in the afternoon, and one in the evening. And um, so we chose, and by we, I really mean my dad. Yeah, chose to model Baruch Hashem off of the morning prayer service, which is found in the Siddur. It's it's called Shachrit, and um, and so there's there's a certain structure to it. Um, and so we, I say we model, it's not exactly, yeah, but it's loosely bound based on, and, yeah. and so, um, we don't do every prayer, but we do some. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, listen, uh, uh, for our service, um, you know, we kind of do like an intro song, um, which is usually something like Shabbat Shalom, mm-hmm. um, something to, it, it kind of like alerts the congregation that we're gathering. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll read a Psalm, which is very common in, in, in the, in the Shachrit. In fact, you read a lot of Psalms in Shachrit mm-hmm. and, and we'll go through a couple liturgical pieces. We have, we do have a song set. So yeah. our song set is generally three to four, five six songs something yeah. like that we do um a jewish prayer called the amida um which which changes there's actually 19 benedictions that are connected with it but on shabbat there's only seven and so we'll do we'll do those on on shabbat also uh we read from the torah mm-hmm. so we have the there's some liturgical prayers that are associated with opening the doors of the ark um, we do a song, we walk, we walk the Torah through the congregation. Mm. Um, and so if you ever come to Baruch Hashem, you'll see the Torahs go out and you'll see people, um, either with, um, their prayer shawl, their talit, um, with the, with the fringe or with the Bible or with their fingers, they'll kiss the Torah. And, um, actually we've had this, we've had question, questions like this where people who are from a Christian background go, well, isn't that idolatry? Mm. And, um, so let me actually just take a, a, a moment and just explain why, in, yeah. in our opinion, it's not. And, um, and, and so the Torah itself is, uh, it's the first five books of Moses, yeah. Genesis through Deuteronomy. It is, so when we say that, it's at, by definition, it's the word of God. Yeah. And uh, it is written on flesh, on either lambskin or, or goat skin, something like that. Yeah. And so it's the word of God written on flesh, and then it is um, attached and then rolled into a scroll form um, to two wooden pieces, uh, which are called the Etz Chaim, which means tree of life. So it is the word of God in flesh hanging on the tree of life. Mm. And when, when you take John 1, where it talks about Yeshua being the word of God, um, who came yeah. and tabernacled among us and, and took on flesh, it, it actually, to me, the, the Torah is almost the perfect symbolic picture of, of looking at a representation of Yeshua himself. Wow. And um, so in, then in Psalm 2, it, it ends with, kiss the son lest he be angry with you. So in that regard, when we kiss the Torah, it's as if we're kissing Yeshua, the Messiah. Wow. And um, again, this is, it's common in, in, the, in the Jewish world. They don't take the same explanation that I do. Yeah. But it's common because in the Jewish world, the Torah is um, the divine revelation of God. Yeah. Um, it's even some in, 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 in certain circles would say the Torah itself is divine because yeah. it's the word of God. Yeah. Um, which wow. I, I think fits right in with my theology. Yeah, totally. So, <laughs> wow. That's crazy. There's a lot of deep stuff like that. Oh, totally. So, but you were saying. Oh yeah. So I was going through the yeah. I was going through the service. Thank you. Thank you for yeah, bringing yeah. Like, where, where were we? <laughs> I'm chewing on the revelation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where are we? So we we have our Torah service, and then we we um we actually so our children are non nursery, so are are kind of slightly older, but not yet teenager children. Okay. Are in the service up until this point, and then they come up and um. Uh, you know, we'll have like some little question and answers to kind of like children engagement in the service. And um, then we'll dismiss them and the Torah gets put away. And then we have a message 
Um, and then we kind of close up. And you, you, you also read a Torah portion? Yeah, no? so we, yeah, we follow the Torah reading, okay. which is basically the same around the world. Yeah. Um, there will be some exceptions, but that's pretty much probably every, more every, than, every synagogue is reading the same. Yeah, Torah every, portion. every synagogue reads the same portion. Almost always. And for our listeners that maybe have never been to a synagogue or a messianic synagogue, pretty much everything that you mentioned would happen in a in a uh, mainstream synagogue. Like yeah, a, actually, a non-messianic synagogue. In, in a non-messianic synagogue, yeah, it, it, the synagogue. I mean, the synagogues I've been to before. Yeah. Um, the elements it, are the, are pretty the much elements the same. are basically the same. The children, their children, just kind of run around the whole time. Yeah. Which I love because I think at some point you end up soaking in some of the totally. things um, as a child. Yeah. Uh, even though you're running around. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the, the ears are still open. Maybe the ears totally. of the heart are still open. Yeah. So I'll tell you one of the differences that's pretty stark between church and synagogue. Yeah. In my, in my opinion, um, church is a pretty, like it's a quiet place. Mm hmm. Like you don't see children running around very often. It's yeah. not loud. You don't hear people arguing. Yeah, we'll put security on them. We'll totally. Get, <laughs> get them out of here. <laughs> Whose kids are those running around? Um, but when you go to a synagogue, it, it's funny. The rabbi can be talking, and you'll have two or three people having, and I don't, I don't mean a quiet discussion, <laughs> but they'll be having a discussion at a side table about the Torah portion, yeah. and it'll get animated, and every now and then. Somebody will turn around and be, hey, I can't hear the rabbi. But but it's it's certainly not a... It's not as orderly and it, quiet. It, it's not silence is yeah. reverence. It's more of a, we're going to discuss and we're going to have reverence for the Lord. Yeah. And through discussion. And we're going to yeah. we're gonna challenge one another. And, hey, I don't think what you're saying is right. Let me show you why I don't think it's right. Yeah. So, I mean, to me, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, that is fun. But... um. um I remember you telling a story where you were talking to, I think it was a jewel, a jeweler that was Jewish oh, yeah. and he had questions. He was like, what synagogue do you go to? Yeah, sure. And he started asking questions. Do you have this? Do you have this? Do you have this? Yeah. Yeah. So the, it, it's interesting that I, I, I'll give the basics of the story. I was talking to him and, and um, he said, what synagogue do you go to? And I said, well, just one down the street. And he said, yeah, yeah. What's the name? And I said, it's Baruch Hashem. And he says, Oh, he says, he says, what are you guys? And I said, I said, well, we're Jews that believe Jesus is the Messiah. He says, yeah, yeah, I know that. Uh, like, what do you do? And, and I don't know, I guess I've just really never thought about that question. Like, what do we do? Yeah. And I was like, what do you mean? And he goes, well, do you, like, when do you have services? And I said, we have Shabbat services. They're on Saturday mornings. And he said, um, he said, do you read from the Torah? And I said, yes. He said, do you have a Bema? And I said, yes. And what's um, a bima? A bima is where you read from the Torah. So the Torah comes out the, on the, a, the on wood a like pedestal. Yeah. So at our place, it's it's wood. Um, on some our, are not on ours, wood, it's but, a music stand. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, but it's the pedestal. And really, the yeah. bima is, is, is in a synagogal setting, is kind of the position of authority. Like that's where the authority lies. It, yeah. It's not necessarily at a, a pulpit it's at the bima mm. why because that's where the word of god is yeah and um so he's like do you have a bima and i said yes and he said do you read the torah yes and, and he's asking right and he stops and he goes he says are there any crosses mm. <laughs> and, and i and i said no and so he looks at me and he goes so you tell me it's a synagogue and i said yes of course i'm telling you it's a synagogue because <laughs> he was expecting probably a church yeah he was expecting a church yeah and, and maybe i can just say something for a moment yeah because i probably just offended half of your audience by saying we don't have crosses <laughs> um partially uh, one of the reasons we don't have crosses at Baruch Hashem is because in the jewish world crosses are extremely offensive yeah and i recognize in in the christian world that the cross um is interpreted by most people as um, a symbol of grace and mercy, salvation and, and salvation love. and love. Yeah. But, but the reality is when you look historically at it, yeah. it was an instrument of death and torture and murder to Jewish and people, to, to Jewish people, really to, to, to all to, people, yeah, to lots of people, but to lots of different people, but, but in particular to Jewish people. Yeah. Um, and I guess in this regard, in particular to Yeshua, because he was a Jewish man yeah. living in a Jewish province yeah. underneath a Roman um, authority. But yeah. it was he was 
he literally died yeah on a cross yeah and so jewish people often don't understand why christians would hang an instrument of death around their neck yeah and, and if i could put it this is not ex- is not entirely the same but it, it would be likened unto putting a, a, a guillotine mm. and carrying a guillotine around your neck if you yeah. You know, if you're familiar with the French Revolution, yeah, like it was an instrument of death, and people lost their heads to yeah. it. And, and and again, I I, re- I totally recognize that Christians don't view it that way. Totally, yeah, yeah. I, um, well, you're you're saying it's funny you say that because we literally had a an interview with two Israeli um, soldiers. This was 11 days before war broke out, hmm. um, and so we were just talking about all things Israel and, and Judaism, and I mentioned the cross does not mean the same thing. To Jewish people that does to Christians, and he said it would be like wearing an electric chair. Is, oh, is, is what he inter- electric chair. I, I, that's that's true. It's good. An electric chair. Um, totally. and Christians do they get offended about this? They are confused by this, and it, it's it's really our ignorance of Christian history. We don't really we don't really learn Christian history. We don't have a value of Christian history. Uh, I think we'd be terrified if we really knew a lot of Christian history. Um, Honestly, there's some uh, again. I look at Christian history and I don't look at it judgmentally. Yeah, yeah. Why? Because we're all humans. Totally. And um, but there is there is a lot of darkness in Christian yeah. Christian history, and Jews were often the recipients of it. Yeah. Uh, of of the darkness and totally. and that darkness led to modern um, yeah. evils. When it, and to me, it's one thing to uh, to not know the history. It's another thing to not know the history and be confused and angry why <laughs> why somebody else is upset by it. Yeah, why someone's yeah. offended by it. Um, because when I tell Christians that are offended about why why is no cross? Why 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 is the cross? Why are you saying don't use the cross? You know, in in this video or with Israel or whatever. And I'm like, because the cross doesn't mean what you think it means to Jewish people. Because for Basically, eighteen, nineteen hundred years, we used the cross in the New Testament and yep. said, "You killed Jesus. You need to denounce your Judaism and you need to accept Christianity, or we're going to murder you." Yep. And then they did. And most people don't know that the Nazis had belts that had the cross on it, and they said, "God is with us." So we do that for eighteen, nineteen hundred years, and now we fast forward to today. We're we we're you know completely unaware of it, and right. we're like, "What is their deal with the cross?" as if we are going to forget about the history. So to me, it's, it's, it's on us to understand, uh, yes, we have a flawed history. Everybody does. We're human. But we have to essentially, what I, what I told these young Israelis, we have to own that and realize, yes, we did that, and that was terrible, and that was wrong. Sure. And I understand why a Jewish person would see the cross now, given 1,900 years of history. And the cross, what Jesus did on the cross is important. Yeah. The the symbol of the cross is just a symbol and we don't need to uh have this holy reverence for the symbol it's what jesus did mm-hmm. it's what yeshua did that is is important and that we revere but that's a touchy oh yeah no it is a touchy subject i mean i don't know if you your audience wants to hear a joke but <laughs> yeah let's be good let's do that there's a good there's a, <laughs> there's a good joke this jewish family yeah they have a kid who really struggles with math and um, he he goes to public school and he just is is beginning to fail and is not succeeding at all. So they take him out and they put him in private school, and um, it, it doesn't really get any better. And so they're like, you know, maybe we'll go to we'll find a we'll find another school. They found another private school that specialized in tutoring with math and 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 helping kids who were having challenges with math. Yeah. And they stuck him in there and and he still was having problems. Well. They found out that the um, the local Catholic school was um, was accepting applications, and and so they stuck him in in that school. And the first week, he comes home A pluses on every every math uh, test, pop quiz, exam. Yeah. And um, they said, you know what what happened? And he said, he said, oh my goodness, he said, I realized that they were they were really about the business of math. He said, because the last Jewish guy that went in there, I saw him hanging on a plus sign. (laughs) 
anyways uh, so it was a bad joke but that's okay what is it out <laughs> <laughs> no it's great uh, that's funny well um here's here's how uh we'll end um what would be your so something we've talked a lot with a lot of people about is like this holy discontent holy discontent meaning like that thing that makes you like righteously angry that oh, i wish the church got this and we've seen it in a lot of different ways because i think the lord gives us different passions and different pur- we're all called to be the body and that means we have different functions and sure some people they just can't uh they get so righteously angry with uh how we treat the poor and we have to be with the poor and we have to yep. you know look at jesus ministry to the poor and it was one of the main things he talked about and then you have other people over here same thing about orphans and about mm-hmm. uh, adoption, and we have to, you know, and then we have someone over here who's about evangelism and the nations and whatever. So you have like all these different uh, people that God gives this holy discontent. What would you say is your holy discontent about uh, the church? Like when you look at the church, how we do church, the average Christian who maybe is unaware of. Uh, the Jewishness of Jesus or Messianic Judaism, is there something that you would say, I just wish that we understood this, or I wish that you prayed about this, or I wish that you... It, it, it's interesting, and, and it's going to sound selfish or self-serving. Yeah. Um, but maybe, it, let, me, let me put it this way. I can't tell you how many times I've had a knock at my door, and I've come out, come out the front door, and there's someone there, hey, let me, can I tell you about Jesus? And... Um, and I said, you can. I said, but let me tell you, I'm Jewish. Again, I, I haven't told them that I'm a Jewish believer. Yeah, yeah. I, I Now I do it as a, as a challenge to see what, what will happen. Yeah. I have never had a person finish the conversation. Whoa. As the, the moment I've said, I'm Jewish, they say, oh, that's nice. And they, they turn and they walk away. Wow. And unfortunately, I don't know if it's true or not, but I would say it's probably at least a perception in the Messianic community, the Messianic Jewish community, that that's, that's the reaction of most churches mm. is, oh, you're Jewish? That's good for you. It is good for Jews to be Jews. I, I, I'm not denying that. Yeah. But if your faith really means as much to you as you think it does, the response, I'm Jewish, shouldn't turn you away. Yeah. It should be like, it, it actually should cause you to go, Man, that's amazing. Yeah. I love the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I love your God. Did yeah. you know that? And and, and it should actually, wow. it shouldn't turn it away. It should, it should spark life that's even more so. Yeah. Because um that's what it is. Yeah. Uh, it, but unfortunately, I don't I don't know how many Christians have that level of faith. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was talking to someone in Israel. And they said, you know, 90% of churches, 98% of churches, whatever it is, the majority of the church has a fatherless Christianity because we're disconnected from Abraham. And so we don't have this, this long history mm-hmm. of, of our roots in the covenant of Abraham, Isaac, yep. and Jacob. And so when you say you're Jewish, it's almost like, oh, that's a different thing than what I'm talking about. Yeah. Not, oh, Wow. That's, I love the God of yeah. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Do you think that's because of sensitivity towards... I think some of it may be sensitivity. Or some you, of it may be, I don't know what to do with a Jewish person, so I'm just, I don't want to be stupid. I don't want to be somebody to think I'm stupid, so I'm just going to yeah. be like, oh, good, oh, thanks. Yeah. Um, I, it could be any number of things. Yeah. I, I do wish, I, I don't know, I, to me, with what Paul says... Gentiles have some sort of innate ability to speak with Jewish people mm-hmm. and help them learn about our Messiah. And the, the interesting thing is, as Paul recognizes this also, is Jewish people have this innate ability, and it's not really its ability, an ability, it's actually a calling from God in Isaiah that says, yeah. go to the nations and be a light to the nations. Yeah. And so when we work together, it's like this... Um, symbiotic relationship where it only grows like a marriage yeah oh yeah like a marriage <laughs> perfect <laughs> yeah right come come back full come back uh, that's selfish i'm like back to my point you mean <laughs> um no but i think you're 100 percent right and i've told people I, I literally spoke at a, uh, a a young adult service and we talked about 
when male and female come together, they're different. They think different. They, oh, totally. Uh, they act different. They have different passions, um, different ways of doing things, and that in, that can cause some friction. Mm -hmm. I don't like that because I want to do it my way. And that, what are you talking about? But when you embrace that and you serve one another, you get a deeper revelation. You get deeper unity. You get yep. a stronger union. And Jews and Gentiles think differently. Totally. And they read scripture differently. And they, it, it's almost like we don't get the full picture if we are just in our own vacuum. Of I, I read like a Gentile through Gentile eyes, void of anything Jewish. But when we come together, there is friction. Mm -hmm. you, you, you have conversations with Jewish people. You're like, well, I don't, I don't read it that way. But then you start to wrestle with it. Wrestle, Israel, wrestle with God, yeah, yeah. wrestle with each other. Then there's this blessing when we serve, submit to one another, serve one another, love one another. There's like a unity that wasn't there before. There's power that wasn't there before. But we've cut off essentially the legs of, of our faith because we, it's void of anything Jewish. Yeah, and I, I think part of the other, I think another negative aspect to that is when you do that, um, how shall, maybe, maybe let me say it this way. What I often say is, if God has forgotten the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then how can you ever believe that he stands a chance of not forgetting you? Totally. Because the reality is, Christians are dependent upon the covenants that, that God started totally. with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and it, and it comes through all of this. And if God is so easily distracted and removed from Israel, then it's only a matter of time before it, it's yeah. from Christians also. Yeah, we should not be secure or feel right. secure at all. Yeah, yeah, no, there Which should that, be... That's Romans eleven eleven, right? I mean, Paul says, um, you know, the roots of this tree, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the natural branches would be the Jewish people. Gentiles have been grafted into that tree. It's not a new tree. It's yeah. not a, its own tree. Grafted into the tree. We are now uh, given nutrients from that covenant of Abraham, mm -hmm. Isaac, and Jacob. And then Paul says something really shocking that I think we try to avoid, which is exactly what you said. If God didn't spare the natural branches, yeah. how much more would he not spare you? And then he says, notice the kindness and severity of God. Yeah. And then he says, don't boast against the branches. Right. Who are the branches? The Jewish people. Mm -hmm. Saying, oh, it's, all, it's about us now. He's like, you weren't even a part of this tree. Right. We should have the utmost respect and thankfulness that we're even a, a, allowed to be on this tree, that we're even a part of this tree, that I can say my spiritual father is Abraham. Mm -hmm. That's a blessing because you are the physical descendant of Abraham. I just get to be here through adoption. Sure. And I have a command in Scripture, Romans 11, not to boast against you, not to boast against the Jewish people, and notice the kindness and severity of God. We love the kindness of God. Yeah, We totally. do not want to talk about the severity <laughs> of God. <laughs> yeah, the severity is never anything you want to talk no, about. No, <laughs> but it's, it's, it, we can't have one without the other. You right. can't have grace without judgment. You can't have love without anger. You can't have kindness without the severity. And we want to... We wanna, cut out the severity, just like we cut out the Jewishness mm -hmm. of Jesus, just like we cut out the Old Testament, because it's in the new now, and it leaves us uh, with a faith that I don't think is uh, the, the authentic faith that God calls us to have. And certainly not a deep faith. No. I would say. Totally. Well, I'm sure we could keep talking oh, yeah, for totally. days, uh, but thank you so much for, for being here, for, for just honestly answering the questions and and navigating through it because i know it's there's complex issues <laughs> and uh and we're also tiptoeing through years of right. checkered history but i think at the end of the day um if we zoom out to you know fifty thousand foot view you can't read scripture and not say god cares about the jewish people they're his firstborn they're his special treasure these are all scriptures firstborn yeah. special treasure apple of his eye inheritance and if we start there and we take the command seriously to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and just allow our hearts to soften towards Israel and the Jewish people, I think we will find uh, the truth in God's heart and hopefully restore this amazing marriage between Jew and Gentile. Yeah, it's, it's, 
uh, if I can say one thing about that apple yeah. of his eye passage, yeah, I think it's an amazing thing. I sometimes I wonder if Christians, when 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 we focus on the Jewish people, get a little bit like, hey, it's not about us, mm-hmm. and 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 kind of get a little discontent in that. Which I I think it's good for everybody to be a little discontent in your own. Yeah. It's not about me. Yeah. Um, idea, but in reality, when we think about that that passage, um, the apple of his eye, the apple is another term for the pupil, mm. and the pupil is the the um, the part of the eye that allows you to see everything else. Mm. So if if Israel is the apple of God's eye, it's it is the part of his eye that allows him to behold the nations. Well, he wants all of the nations. As much as he wants Israel, he has chosen to use Israel to view as the the lens by which to view the nations. Wow. So we can't even have a full understanding of going out to all nations and making disciples of all nations if we don't have the Israel piece. Right. Understood. It's a there's That's I there's some interesting things there. So I mean, I view it God loves God loves you if you're Jewish, God loves you if you're not. Yeah. I in in this is and I think this is where people when they say, well, there's neither Jew nor nor Greek, you know, from the Galatians passage, yeah. they're talking about in terms of value, yeah, or, or or proximity, or proximity, or even deserving of salvation, yeah, all of which is true. There, we're all in equal places yeah. of not deserving God's love. Yep. He just has chosen a particular method by which to extend it. Yeah. So that's so good. Well, thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Hopefully there's a round two at some point in time. We'll go round two. Ding, ding, ding. (laughs) Awesome. (laughs) 